Hello, everyone. I think we're ready to begin. First off, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Diane Frendak, the Director of Membership Services at the AAAS, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, How to Start Career Planning in the Astronomical Sciences. This is our first virtual career panel discussion ever, I think, by the American Astronomical Society. And I'd like to thank today's panelists in advance for their expertise and insights for you, the next generation of scientists. Before we start, I have two general webinar items for you. First, everyone in this webinar is in listen-only mode, but we will definitely encourage your participation. Please share your questions by typing them into the questions pane or the questions box in the control panel. We will collect these questions uh, for Q&A during the session. So don't wait until the end if you have questions at the beginning of the discussion. Number two, if you miss something during today's talk, fear not. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the AAAS website within the next week. Um, I see a few more people logging in. I guess, uh, Elena, we could go to the slides um, and I could show um, where we usually post our webinars when they're done and you'll see the upcoming schedule here. Um, we also have um, them posted on our YouTube channel and the URL is there. Um, and then the next slide, um, we have some tips that we're gonna be posting soon to our website and will probably be part of um, an AAS News Digest. Um, the second one there, the 13 questions to ace a virtual interview um, is handy to know, especially next month when we're having a virtual interviewing webinar on the 19th of August. And now let me introduce our moderator, Elena G. Levine. Elena is an award-winning entrepreneur STEM career consultant, science journalist, professional speaker, and corporate comedian. Her book, Networking for Nerds, has the honor of being named one of the top five books of 2015 by Physics Today magazine. She writes Your Unicorn Career, a careers column for science careers, which I think is done by AAAS, um, and that's about finding your professional bliss. Elena is also a frequent speaker for the AAAS. Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone. This is my honor and my privilege as always to work with you and to work with the AAS. Thank you, Diane, uh, for your support to talk about important issues to help you advance in your career, to help you build a career of your dreams, to build a career that is a customized, exciting career that allows you to do what you truly enjoy. And I am so excited about our um, uh, about our uh, attendees and uh, excuse me about our, our panelists today this is going to be a conversation um, and as Diane said we want to hear from you I'm going to be taking questions throughout the webinar not just at the end so as you have questions that come up for any of the panelists for myself or for Elizabeth and Joel we want to hear from you and you are welcome to tweet this entire talk or post anything that we say, you're welcome to take photographs of the slides. We ask that if you do tweet, you use the handle for the organization, AAS underscore office. Elizabeth Frank, she has her own Twitter handle, at efrankplanetary. Mine is at Elena G. Levine. And in join us on LinkedIn. Join me in particular. I send out a lot of free career planning resources via LinkedIn. So connect with me on LinkedIn so that I can send you those, those resources to help you advance the career in your career the way you want to do it. So let me start. Elizabeth Frank is joining us. We got Joel Kastner. And what's super cool about Elizabeth and Joel, actually, there's so many things that are cool, super cool about both of them. But what's especially cool in my mind at this moment is that they are both members of a very important committee of the AAAS, and that's the Employment Committee. So welcome, Elizabeth. Welcome, Joel. So glad you're here. Thank you very much, Elena. Thanks for having us. So why don't we start? We are talking about building a career, starting a career in the astronomical sciences. Elizabeth, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do, where you work right now, and a little bit about your career path? Sure. Uh, so I currently work at a small business called First Mode based in Seattle. Um, we do mostly engineering consulting, um, primarily in aerospace and the mining industry. 
um, basically taking the principles and practices of space systems engineering and applying it to problems um, both on and beyond Earth. Uh, but my background is actually in geology and planetary geochemistry in particular. So uh, for undergrad, I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York, and I majored in interdisciplinary science with a geology major and astrobiology minor. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I really wanted to be a research scientist in um, planetary geology. Initially, I was intrigued by astrobiology. I ended up going to the University of Colorado at Boulder uh, to get a PhD in planetary geochemistry, um, and CU Boulder is a great school for that. Um, but kind of along the way, I started to have in the back of my mind, like, maybe I don't want to stay in academia. Um, I did have the opportunity to do an internship at the Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, um, as a grad student, and that really got me excited about missions. And so I was particularly uh, excited to have a postdoc um, working on the MESSENGER mission. But my MESSENGER was a spacecraft that visited the planet Mercury. Um, I did data analysis as a postdoc during the mission while it was active. Um, I worked on the X-ray spectrometer data. So I was getting like live, like squiggly lines coming to my laptop live from space. It was awesome. Kind of the pinnacle of a planetary scientist career in many ways. But at some point I was like, you know, this day-to-day -day life isn't fulfilling for me as an individual. and I decided to focus on looking for career opportunities outside of uh, traditional academic paths. And so I ended up uh, joining Planetary Resources, the asteroid mining company, initially as a geospatial analyst, um, and eventually became the director of data, the data product team there. And I um, was one of the leaders in the team in defining what an asteroid prospecting mission would have to do and be and what the, that spacecraft would look like and um, that kind of thing. Um, and I worked closely with engineers uh, at that company. Um, unfortunately, um, planetary resources ran out of money. Um, everybody was laid off. Uh, it was mildly traumatic for everybody involved. Um, but the phoenix that rose from the ashes was first mode. So 11 people from planetary resources, um, not including myself, founded first mode. Um, and I joined six months later after I went on a jaunt through New Zealand to take some needed time off. Um, and so I've been with first mode for the past couple of years as an applied planetary scientist. And I currently do a mix of business development, um, project management, and technical uh, support as needed throughout the company. So my, my job's very dynamic and diverse. I love the, the way you describe your career and, and the fact that you were able to identify for yourself what it is that you truly enjoy doing, what types of problems you enjoy solving. Um, and we're able to be in this new frontier type of ecosystem with the uh, with planetary resources now with first mode. And I also love the fact that your title is planetary scientist. I love that. I love that. I made my own title. Even one of the benefits of working at a small business is that you get to pick your own title. So there you go. I love yeah. that. Joel, why don't you tell? Can you tell us a little bit about what you do now? Where you? How you got there? A little bit about your career progression. Sure. Um, Elena, as the senior panelist here, I'll try to sum up uh, 30 years in, in astrophysics, astronomy and astrophysics in like two minutes. Um, well, basically, I'm an accidental professor, I think. Um, I, I'm at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I'm, I was hired into their Center for Imaging Science 20 years ago. Now I've been there 20, a little over 20 years. Um, and we started an astrophysics uh, PhD program a little more than 10 years ago. Um, and I'm on the faculty of that as well. It's a kind of a cross-disciplinary department between um, several different, uh, a couple different um, departments here at RIT. Um, but okay, so to take you back, I was a physics major at, um, at the University of Maryland and, and sort of divided as to whether I wanted to do physics or do I want to do music because I play guitar and, you know, playing guitar in clubs, um, you know, as, a, as an itinerant musician was a lot of fun. Um, I started taking, after I got my bachelor's degree, I, I started taking, um, astronomy classes part-time at the University of Maryland after getting my bachelor's there, um, in part because I, I could. Um, I, no other reason than that. I thought, wow, this is interesting. You can actually take cl uh, classes in, you know, in, in stellar, um, stellar evolution and stellar structure. That's kind of cool. So I, I took uh, a, a couple of those classes and sort of got hooked. Um, it was just amazing to me that the way that you could use such a diverse range of physics um, in, you know, in to, to apply to, to a single topic, a star. Um, and so, um, actually, um, I, I guess as I've, I've told the two of you, my my decision to to be more serious about astrophysics was made when my wife decided to um, to become a, a journalist. She went out to the West Coast to USC, and I started applying to schools like crazy in, on the West Coast so I could join her. Um, and I wound up getting my my PhD, my master's first, and my PhD from UCLA, um, working with Ben Zuckerman. And Ben's been a great influence and still um, close friend and and colleague um, all these years later. 
Um, and so from there, I went to the to uh, a postdoc at um, Haystack Observatory, radio observatory run by MIT uh, in um, in up, uh, just outside Boston, and then went to MIT proper to work on the Chandra Science Center for six years. So I sort of got the experience of of working with uh, at a, at a essentially major national science center, uh, which was contracted out to to various universities, including MIT, um, Harvard, and so on. And then um, got hired onto the faculty of, of the Center for Imaging Science. All these things, all these steps were sort of um, accidental in a way, you know, just taking advantage of opportunities. So we can talk about that um, if you like later on. Thanks, Joel. And uh, you make a great point too. I mean, the idea that a lot of the career planning that we're advocating, a lot of the career planning that we hope you will engage in, and a lot of the career planning that we did was not necessarily strategically detail-oriented from day one. Like we didn't sit down as a freshman and say, all right, this is where we're gonna, you know, like this is gonna be the full extent of our career. We had ideas and we took opportunities as the opportunities led that led us to more and more enjoyment, more things that would bring us intellectual pleasure. Um, while, as you said, Joel, as you pointed out, also recognizing our priorities, our life values and life priorities, which we are gonna talk about too. So it's a very, very interesting thing. Thank you both. You know, one of the reasons why I was so excited to do this topic with you was because some of you may know, and I don't like to tell too many people, but I was an astronomy physics major, was seduced by the dark side and got my degree in mathematics. But as you know, astronomy and physics, it's pretty much like the godfather. Once you're in, you can't get out and you don't wanna leave. It's fantastic, it's fun. But the thing is, is that I came to the University of Arizona from New Jersey as a student to become a theoretical astrophysicist. I was so certain that that's what I was gonna be. Now, where I would work and what that meant, I had no idea. I didn't understand it because I had never asked any questions. This is part of what we're gonna be talking about today. So when I got to the U of A, I actually went and didn't know that I shouldn't do this, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do this either, but I went and spoke to an astrophysicist in the, in the Department of Physics, and I said, can I work with you? And he said, sure, and he made a phone call, and I walked out of his office with a NASA Space Grant internship, something that typically students have to apply for, but he just made a phone call and was able to get money <laughs> to support me working for him because I asked for it, because I was present. And um, again, I think it's great to pursue opportunities to express your ambition. Very, very useful and your bravery too. But the, here's the thing. I started doing research for him. He was working on cosmology and quasars and Lyman alpha clouds. And I envisioned before I joined his team that a theoretical astrophysicist sits around all day pondering really interesting intellectual puzzles like the twins paradox and going faster than the speed of light and wormholes and black holes and black uh, and uh, and white holes. And uh, that's what I thought would be done. Like they would just be total uh, engagement and conversation with nerds. Elizabeth and Joel, is that what astronomers, astrophysicists, planetary scientists do? A small percentage of their time, let's say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't a festival of conversation with nerds. That's not what it is. In fact, I ended up working in the basement at two o'clock in the morning, uh, writing Fortran programs to look at all this code. I wasn't even going and looking at the cool images or even going to the telescopes themselves or having any interaction with them, just doing coding. And that's when I started to realize that what I should have done was I should have probably asked an astrophysicist what they do and what their career is like and what tasks they do every day to better understand how I could potentially prepare for a career. As you probably guess, I love talking a lot. So me being in a communications career makes total sense. Me being only doing research probably doesn't, especially since I don't necessarily enjoy doing scientific research. I enjoy speaking and communicating about it. So it's very interesting to think about. That's how I launched my thoughts and my planning about careers. Um, we wanted to talk to you as we're going forward today, we wanted to talk to you what we mean when we say a career in astronomical sciences or in astronomy. I'm gonna use those words interchangeably. Another phrase I'm gonna use, we're gonna use is space sciences. So what we're talking about is the whole uh, gamut, the whole spectrum of different areas of space sciences, which includes astronomy, including the observational and theoretical, which is the actual astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology. It also includes planetary science, like what Elizabeth is an expert in, which could include a combination of geology with astronomy, geophysics, geochemistry, other areas. 
Elizabeth, Joel, what do you think of when we think about a career and when you're thinking about the employment committee, a career in astronomical sciences, what does that sort of mean to you? What does it encapsulate for you? Elizabeth, you want to have a go, or I could I could try. <laughs> go ahead, you're the chair. I'll let you take it first. Uh, right, I'm, I'm the chair of the employment committee, which means that I, I just listen to the employment committee and learn from them. Um, but uh, I think it, it. So one thing I would say is you're, you've you've hit on at least two of the three pillars I think of uh, as at least in terms of, uh, of astronomy and astrophysics, planetary science, perhaps too. You know, Elizabeth can can inform us better there. Um, and that is, there's an obser observational component, there's a theoretical compo component. I also think of an instrumentation component. People are building stuff. Um, and that, that the, those of us who are observers, myself, I consider myself an observer, um, we take advantage of. So those are the sort of the three pillars, if you like. And if you look at the, at the things that, that Elena's laid out here, you can sort of group them in that, in that general category. Anybody who does any of that stuff is going to be doing data analysis. So that's why you mentioned, you know, I'm in a basement coding. Um, I'm sitting here, you know, in, in, in this room. I'll be doing a lot of coding later today. So there's coding is involved. Writing is involved. Um, uh, you know, uh, working in groups and trying to understand what everyone is good at and, and, and collaborating is involved. Those are some of the things I would say. Uh, it's, it's almost like any other career in the sciences in that sense. Elizabeth, what are your yeah. thoughts? So planetary science, um, it's sort of, uh, this is kind of an oversimplification, but it's a bit of a hybrid between geology and astronomy um, with other aspects thrown in there. Uh, my expertise is planetary geochemistry, so the chemistry of space rocks, uh, but you've got folks coming in from geology departments, from physics departments, and we all kind of work together to try to understand the nature of you know, things in our solar system. Um, and so uh, there is a kind of like what, what Joel was talking about, there's the observational part, the theoretical part, there's an experimental part as well. Um, this uh, and we also have these spacecraft that you know bring back amazing data from us or from across the solar system for us to, to process and analyze. Um, and the day-to-day -day work on that is you know kind of like what Joel was saying, data analysis, um, reading, writing, communicating, that kind of thing. Um, and personally, as someone who now works in industry, I found that many of those skills that I developed in academia are actually extremely transferable over into my current job. Um, and I'm like basically an expert Googler at this point from looking up you know, papers on Google Scholar for as many years as I did uh, while I was in academia. Um, and so there's lots of things along the way that you know, academics tend to think of themselves as experts in a topic, whereas in industry, people tend to identify themselves by their skill sets. So it's kind of like a reframing and rethinking of, of how you approach things. But um, I think one thing we should certainly talk about more is like what those transferable skills actually are and, and you know, how people can use them to their benefit later on in their career. Absolutely. And how to effectively market yourself or communicate that those skill sets in whatever ecosystem you decide to go into. Um, you know, the one of the things we already got a question about majors, and I just want to ask you both uh, a question. To pursue a career in the astronomical sciences, in space sciences, do you have to have a degree, an undergraduate degree, not a PhD in this case, an undergraduate degree in astronomy, in planetary science, or is physics or mathematics sufficient? What are your thoughts on this? I am a physics major, so that maybe answers your question right there. Um, I, I guess it really depends on a person's preference. You know, it's something that, that um, I watch my, the undergraduates at RIT wrestle with. Um, I think going, doing a physics major, you can't lose, I'll put it that way. Um, but there are people who've been very successful doing other sorts of majors, um, math plus, plus computer science, for example. Um, uh, there are, astro there are, are places that offer astronomy programs for undergraduates and have very strong astronomy majors um, with a, a, a component of physics. I would think, I would advise people um, to, to think about physics primarily, but not exclusively, because there are so many other things that enter into it that you want to keep an open mind, especially as an undergraduate. Good point. Thank you, Joel. Did you have something to add, Elizabeth? Yeah, so I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle because of planetary science. Um, but kind of echoing what Joel said, um, there are, at, I know of at least one planetary science undergraduate degree in the country. Uh, I actually recommend against planetary science as an undergraduate degree because it's such a general degree that I, I fear that students would leave with um, a degree that nobody really understands and isn't marketable if they decide not to go into planetary science as a research career. So I recommend pursuing geology. So then you have, you know, if you leave school, you have a geology undergrad, 
um, employers in any sector will know what that actually means in terms of your education. First, planetary science is still a relatively new field that's only been around for a few decades. Um, so starting with something that's um, really like a core pillar of science, like geology, like physics, like mathematics, I think really start with that foundation that increase your um, level of uh, specificity and specialty um, as you move forward in your career. And I've known uh, even friends of mine when I was at the University of Arizona and students that I've mentored over the years who have exclusively majored just in physics, just in mathematics, just in geosciences, but did research in the astronomy department, did research in optics, developing instrumentation for telescopes, uh, did projects uh, with um, different colleagues in different divisions so that they could gain those skills and gain the knowledge base of those communities within space science but still have that degree, which they initially loved in the first place. It's interesting to me how you can do that. One other thing I'd mention along these same lines, Elena, is that um, you, know, hear, you hear a lot of buzz um, in the, today's academia about cross-disciplinary research, you know, as that it's something that you have to kind of impose on yourself. Oh, I better be cross-disciplinary. Well, if you're, if you're interested in astronomy, if you're interested in space sciences, planetary science, you are going to be a cross-disciplinary researcher or, um, or you know, component of an indus industry uh, job or whatever. You're, you're going to have to think in cross-disciplinary ways. So, you know, as long as you're, you keep that mindset from the beginning, I think, then you'll be successful. Well, and Elizabeth, like you said, you work already. I mean, you worked in your career, within your career. You've worked with engineers. You worked with, I imagine, data scientists, people from different uh, facets of the space sciences continuum. Uh, mm -hmm. has, has that interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary environment been something that really appeals to you in this career? Yeah, it's interesting that you asked that question because I reflect back now on my career and I found that the pattern in my, my resume slash CV is kind of working in the interstities. So like my my undergrad degree was literally interdisciplinary science and I created my own astrobiology degree and astrobiology itself, which is a study of the origin, evolution and distribution of life in the universe is a very, very interdisciplinary degree. People uh, or field study people from you know uh, astronomy, astrophysics, biology, but like it's just like everybody in, uh, works on that. Um, so I, I found that I've actually very, I'm very drawn to interdisciplinary topics and that um, is aided by my ability to communicate across disciplines. And so one of the things that I've learned about myself over the course of my career is that I think like a systems engineer, um, a systems engineer is someone who uh, is the, the common job role, uh, especially in the context of uh, spacecraft engineering, but basically they're the people who kind of form the glue between the mechanical engineers and the electrical engineers and software engineers that kind of like they have to provide that, um, uh, yeah, like the glue essentially that pulls projects together and makes sure that the right people are talking to each other. And so for me, that's actually something that appeals to me about what I do and has been kind of a common theme of my own personal career. Elizabeth, we just received a question specifically about planetary science. I'd like to ask you, and Joel, uh, you weigh in too, please. Uh, somebody asks, if you have an interdisciplinary degree in physics and math and now teach high school mathematics, would this help this person uh, in trying to move forward to, in getting into planetary science and academia. So the combination of the math and physics with the, in an interdisciplinary degree with a high school um, a, a job experience, is this a helpful foundation? Um, it's not a career path I'm familiar with personally. Uh, I'm t on average, people tend to go right from undergrad to grad school, but I don't see how that can hurt, especially if you want to be a professor, like if you have that foundation of teaching experience and that's the career goal that you want for yourself. Um, and planetary science or another ex area of expertise, like I, I don't see how it can hurt. Um, so uh, my general advice for people, um, because I, people ask me a lot about industry careers, is like figure out what's most important to you and make decisions along the way that kind of get you closer to that, what that long-term broad vision is and what your values are, which I think we're going to talk about later. Um, but if you want to be a planetary science professor, um, then sure, why not? Go for it. And it's just a matter of communicating as you're going through the process of applying for graduate school or applying for jobs, why your experience and your degrees would be useful to that organization or that team. So speaking Absolutely. of industry, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the different types of sectors where you would find careers in space science and the astronomical sciences. Of course, we've been talking a lot about academia and industry that includes startups like the ones that Elizabeth has worked for. Um, but we're also talking about nonprofits. 
um, which could include associations or foundations, and of course, government sector, which includes working for government laboratories and agencies. But just to clarify for, for you, just as you think about uh, building a career in the astronomical sciences and space sciences, typically, if you do wanna go into research, typically the path is getting an undergraduate degree in a hard science. In this case, it could be astronomy or it could be physics or geosciences, um, getting a PhD, getting a postdoc or two or three, uh, and then moving into a research career in, in any one of these different sectors. Um, so that's typically, if you wanna move into research, that's typically the path, just something to think about. So the next thing we wanted to address were um, what we call, and I, I say this with a smile and a bit of a joke, the typical paths and ecosystems for typical careers. And I'm laughing as I'm saying this, I know my panelists agree, because there's no such thing as a typical career. There are so many different types of careers and no two people have the same career, even if they had the same experience moving through the same universities, the same programs. So let's talk a little bit about the different, um, what are some common, for example, paths and ecosystems where you might find common careers in space sciences and astronomical sciences. And uh, again, Elizabeth and uh, Joel, as you have other ideas, feel free and just jump in and add to this. So we're talking about, first of all, the research ecosystem, which which includes major research universities um, as well as smaller as well as smaller universities. There's also state universities, which themselves are often um, not necessarily always, but can be um, very uh, invested in high-level research enterprises. There's also primarily undergraduate institutions, PUIs. And Joel, am I correct in saying that Rochester Institute of Technology is a PUI? Is that correct? Well, we're kind of, I, I don't know, we, we, I, we consider ourselves an R2 university, so we have we have a few graduate programs, uh, 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 PhD programs, that are, well, actually a large number of master's programs, and a few PhD programs. So, and, and so it, but it's mostly, it's still mostly undergraduates though, right? Right, Your, our population is predominantly undergraduate, that's true, yeah. yes. So I guess with the PUIs, I'm also thinking about like liberal arts schools or small private institutions um, that are just for undergraduates, still have research opportunities, uh, still doing high level uh, interesting projects, but you're not gonna necessarily, you're not gonna get a, a master's or a PhD from that institution. There's also research institutions where you could work. Uh, two that come to mind are the Space Science Institute in Boulder and the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Um, the STSCI, they do a lot of major missions. Um, they are in charge of uh, James Webb and they're in, they've been doing Hubble. Am I missing another major mission that they've worked on? Do you guys know? Well, that's it. Yeah, there's also Those the Chandra, Chandra, Chandra X-ray Center that's, that's housed at Smithsonian. Um, and, uh, and there's the IPAC, which, which has a big hand in infrared space missions um, out in, uh, in Pasadena. And there's quite a few more of these, uh, like, um, so they're sort of private, sometimes they're a public-private partnership, um, but they're, they're their own institution that does focus on research and instrument design and instrument utilization and facilities management often as well. Um, our, own, um, our own member, um, Amanda, would, be, would hate it if I didn't mention National Radio Astronomy Observatories too, which is a large national um, radio net, uh, network of, of radio astronomers running radio observatories around the world. Around the world. And so in addition to that, you would also find research uh, researchers or re research being done in research laboratories, uh, such as those run by the government, as well as in industry, in uh, research and development divisions, R&D. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the teaching, in the teaching type of careers, um, there's teaching opportunities at the university level and the community college and everything in between, high school, of course. And then I always tell people, if you really love teaching, particularly astronomy and physics and geosciences too, think about private institutions, private schools, because there's often more funding, there's more funding for field trips, there's more funding for experiments. Um, there's a, it's a very uh, enriching environment um, because it is a rich environment oftentimes, so there's more resources. It can be a very interesting uh, career path for you to consider as well. On the outreach and communication side where I work, um, there's careers in journalism, both working for publications full-time or part-time as staff members, and then also as a freelance professional like myself. There's what are called PIOs or um, uh, public information officers. 
that's essentially the public relations arm and the media relations arm of universities, of museums, of telescope operations, institutions, things like that. There's outreach coordinators who can work in any sort of any sort of different type of ecosystem like universities or associations, of course, working for museums. And then there's private company communications or private institution communications and marketing as well. Um, industry, I will come back to in just a moment because it's such a such a large thing to say, like I wanna work in industry. It's a huge enterprise in and of itself. But the final sort of thing we wanted to just share with you under this uh, uh, category was just the government types of positions. So working as a program officer or a PO, doing program management of telescope operations, doing program management of grant operations to give grants to astronomers and geoscientists and planetary scientists, working in the science policy arena, working in communications, even evaluation. Now, industry. Elizabeth, in particular, I want to ask you, but Joel, I want your opinion as well, being both that you're on the employment committee. What are some of the common questions you get from early career astronomers, from people who are starting their careers about how to even begin to consume or even begin to fathom what a career in industry means? What do, how do you even begin to share and counsel people about pursuing careers in industry? What are the careers in industry? Yeah, I guess the first thing is to kind of give them an idea of what industry actually means. It's like you said, it's a really broad term uh, and encompasses everything from one person LLCs all the way to multinational corporations. Um, so for example, you can have a one person company that you created yourself or it could include like Lockheed Martin, which is a you know behemoth, very large company. Um, and it's important to note that the culture and work environment um, can vary a lot across industry, depending on the size of the company and the history of the company and um, many other factors involved. Um, so I guess there's, I let people know like what it is that's different about industry. Um, one thing that I think people should recognize is that uh, one thing that, about academia that maybe is underappreciated is the level of freedom that you get in uh, choosing the direction of your research and your projects. For an industry, it's more of a top-down. Unless you own the company, you're probably just doing what you're told to some degree, although there's, there's a, again, a variety in the level of freedom that you may have in your particular role. Um, and so if you, know, if you really like being your own boss, then maybe industry wouldn't be the right place for you. Um, but on the other hand, um, there are plenty of great things about industry, um, like depending on where you go, like if it's a big company, there might be a lot of resources at hand. Um, uh, I really appreciate like the scrappy, fast-paced startup nature of the companies that I've worked in. Um, although I guess first mode is profitable now, so we're not, not startup anymore. <laughs> um, so I, I guess the first thing is really just for people to kind of explore um, what their own values are, what's most important to them, and, and see if an industry career aligns with that. And then recognize that there's a lot of variety within the term industry itself. And it's interesting about uh, industry, quote unquote industry, uh, as you say, there's a lot of diversity, there's a lot of differences. It also depends which sector. Are we talking about a company like Ball Aerospace or Lockheed Martin? Are we talking about a company that does data science and uh, for other types of sectors like oil, oil and gas or energy where you've migrated into a career where you're doing more data science and data analysis type of careers? Even within a, a large enterprise, um, the way org teams are organized, the way divisions are organized differs from company to company. But I would say, and both of you correct me if I'm wrong, the one thing that we can say for sure that is pretty much clear across almost any company is that you, if you're doing research, if you're in the research and de development division, an R&D scientist, uh, the research that you do, as you said, Elizabeth, top down, it's top down, it's feeding the bottom line of the company because the company's goal is to make money, it's to sell products. So your role as an R&D scientist is to produce science and discoveries and results that will ultimately be utilized to create a solution which will then be utilized to create an innovation into a product. So everything falls in line to develop into a product. There's very few companies that do allow the blue sky type of research, but one that does come to mind is 3M, the materials company, Scotch tape they make, for example. They, their R&D scientists are given what, are, what is metaphorically referred to as the 15% rule, where they're allowed to, to pursue their own projects, their own research projects, 
15% of the time that they're working there, their own projects to see where that work that blue sky, that innovation that's not tied to a product, that's not tied to a top-down initiative could potentially lead. And the famous story of how Post-it notes became in, was invented is absolutely tied to that 15% rule is because they allowed their scientists to play and explore. But not every company has that. Have you seen that in any companies that you've interacted with, um, both Elizabeth and Joel? Um, not like 3M. Um, and uh, so there's, Making money is obviously uh, at the highest level a uh, goal for any company, but you might see a lot more freedom at venture funded companies that um, are not actually profitable, but that they are getting money from uh, venture capitalists. And so there is more freedom for the company to pursue um, what they want to work on, like asteroid mining, for example, which was never quite made profitable, uh, but we were given the freedom uh, collectively as a company to kind of figure out what does that even mean? What does it entail? What do we have to do to even make it a possible thing? Um, but the company ran out of money and you know everybody got laid off so not everything works i guess <laughs> yeah. uh we got an interesting question and uh, i just want to inject it interject it here because it's relevant to our previous conversation and it's relevant to what we're going to be continuing to talk about um regarding the uh, the requirement of a PhD. So Dylan asks, if you want to do a career in teaching outreach or communications, do you necessarily need a PhD? And of course, the answer is no, you do not necessarily need a PhD. But are there other realms or other career paths where the two of you have found a PhD is necessary besides becoming a professor? So I guess I, I would jump in here to say that um, you can do the sorts of, of work that we've all been talking about, especially in the industrial sector, um, with, without a PhD. It's more a question of how much autonomy you want to have. As I understand it, Elizabeth should correct me if I'm wrong. It's more a matter of how much autonomy you want to have within that job domain that you have. Because I think the, the more advanced your degree, the more you've demonstrated that you can tackle difficult problems and the more responsibility you're likely to get. And the, with, with responsibility comes responsibility. It can be uh, a pain, but um, also it be, you get some freedom to think outside the box, to develop, to do your own kind of development, to, go, to follow your whims and your instincts, to develop new things. Um, and, and actually, when we were talking about career, uh, or you know, careers in industry, in, in, industrial partners, I've seen that, that allow that sort of, of freedom. Um, we've had we historically at Rochester Institute of Te Technology we had a lot of contact with the company formerly known as Kodak, um, which you know maybe Elaine is old enough to remember I don't know, what? but they, they were <laughs> they they were of course bought their their commercial and government systems division was responsible for um, many of the very successful space missions that had astronomy as their goal. And um, that included Chandra, that included um, aspects of the Hubble Space Telescope. Their, their team of scientists was in fact um, helpful in figuring out what was wrong with Hubble and fixing it in the first place. Um, and so they, they, I think that company, the, 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 the commercial and government systems part of Kodak is now Harris. Um, and those scientists that, that have been working on those problems for a long time hired other scientists and engineers that could continue that tradition. So they are still working on space missions and the people working on those missions know so much about them and so much more than the company knows that they're given lots of latitude to do the right thing to advance those missions. And that involves creative thinking. Very good point. Um, I don't like that swipe about my age, I, I, but if you'll excuse me just a second, I have to shut my VCR off because I'm taping Laverne and Shirley for later. So, but we can get back to that. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about the task that you would be doing if you were doing research. And we've kind of talked a little bit about this. We've talked a little bit about instrument design and testing, management of missions and telescope operations. Of course, there's data analysis, there's the theory. So any computational work of, of all kinds, and then there's the business side of science of research, uh, which involves the grant proposal writing, the managing budgets, personnel, facilities. Guys, is there anything else that, are there other tasks and that we should be thinking about if we want to go into a career in research in the astronomical sciences? I mean, I think communicating your research, including the writing and the public speaking part of it, like no matter what you're doing, that's going to be useful in a cross-cutting skill set. So. 
um, being in front of a crowd, telling people what you did, um, discussing your work, writing it down, publishing it. I think that's an important part that should be included here. Absolutely. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, so one of the question, one of the things we wanted to talk with you about was the main questions that you can start to ask yourself and ask around you as you ponder your career. But before we say this, we, the three of us want to just clarify something for you and really solidify this point to you, that careers are fluid. We are not advocating that you have to determine your career path now. And by now, we don't mean in your junior year as a college student or in your third year as a PhD student or a master's student or in your second postdoc or in, in your late 20s, your 40s, your 50s or your 60s. Careers change. Uh, they are movable. They, it's a complex system in which we operate. And you yourself are a dynamic biased system that is constantly getting uh, stimulated by different types of uh, stimuli in a system, in the ecosystem in which you're operating, which gives you new perspective on what you could be doing and what would bring you joy and what types of careers you might perform, uh, might pursue and what types of tasks you might perform. So this constantly changing individual uh, unit or the individual in the system is constantly changing as the system is and so i don't want you to think we don't want you to think that you have to decide right now what we want to do is give you information and arm you with questions to think about to ask as you endeavor as you aim to to build a career and of course you can make that pivot and make multiple pivots at any point that you want to make so what are some of the questions you should be asking? So, and I loved Elizabeth brought this subject up as we were planning for this. Elizabeth, talk about this a little bit about what, why you want to explore both tasks and subjects that you enjoy, which could include teaching or research. It could include quasars and Mars. Why is that an important element? Yeah, so I, I from my own experience, um, so I knew that I loved planetary science and planetary geology as an undergrad. Um, I started to get insight into the proposal writing part of it, the research part of it, the you know, paper writing part of it as an undergrad when I did uh, various uh, internships. So I just got like a little taste of it. And then I started to understand that better and better as I was a grad student. Um, and then in my postdoc, I was realizing that the day-to-day -day grind of all of that really wasn't what I enjoyed on a day-to-day -day level, even though I was working on a NASA mission. Um, and so I still have a passion for missions and space exploration. Um, and planetary science, which is a topic, but that doesn't mean that I enjoy the day-to-day -day tasks um, in a particular role that uh, is in the context of that topic. Um, so for example, I knew from my first year of grad school of teaching that teaching wasn't for me. I think teaching is really important, and I think it's uh, really important that people who teach are excited about teaching, and I, that wouldn't have been a, a great fit for me. Um, I also like a work that's much faster paced. Um, so at first when I work on projects that are sometimes as short as six weeks. Um, and so I find that pace really dynamic and interesting. And I get to work on a lot of different topics as opposed to the long term um, uh, way that research works or sometimes you don't see the fruits of your results for years and years. Um, so I think it's important that we separate like the topic that you work on versus the tasks that are involved in a particular job that might be under the, the umbrella of that topic. Very good point. Uh, when we think about uh, other questions that we want to ponder, that we want to ask, we also want to ask, what is it that you like about and what is it that you like in the space science community? Um, Joel, what ha how has that question sort of helped you to make the right career choices for you? Well, in, I, I, as I mentioned, I think, you know, in grad school, as, as a part-time grad student, still trying to figure out what I was doing, I realized that, that um, stellar structure and evolution um, held an awful lot of interest for me. And um, I didn't necessarily think that that might be what I did for a career. That did not occur to me until much later in the game, I think. Um, but that's what I ended up doing. And I, su I suppose um, that's kind of a lesson in, in listening to yourself. <laughs> Had I listened to myself more closely, I might have predicted this is where I would wind up. Um, but it, it just worked out that way. You know, and we, we were talking about you know, accidental left turns, you know, when I was hired onto this, the faculty of the Center for Imaging Science, um, at one point there was a possibility I was going to be doing remote sensing rather than astrophysics. And I can tell you that had I done that, I think I would have been perfectly happy doing that because once you've developed a, a good set of skills and you've tackled some interesting problems, you start to realize that when someone hands you a very difficult problem, um, you can lose yourself in it very easily. 
So if you're the sort of person who wants to lose yourself in tough problems, then you can't lose by getting uh, some sort of an advanced degree in space sciences, because no matter what you end up working on, it's gonna be interesting. And it's also, thank you, Joel, it's also useful to determine what part of the ecosystem of space sciences that you do wanna work in. Do you wanna work on the research side as a researcher or as a, somebody who is supporting research? Do you wanna work on the teaching, the outreach, the advocacy side? You know, my first job after I graduated from uh, the University of Arizona was working for the physics department of the U of A as the director of communication. So I started in science communications and that's when I began to realize, ah, I can combine my love of astronomy and physics and other areas of STEM with my love of speaking and writing and communicating in other forms. That is a, that's a career path. That's a part of the ecosystem supporting astronomy and, research and physics research, supporting STEM that I can be a part of and I would be very happy in and I would thrive in. So making notes as you make those, like you said, accidental left turns to make mental notes to say, huh, am I enjoying this? What am I enjoying about this? Uh, what's special about this experience to me is very, very useful in your, uh, in your pursuit. So when we are pursuing a career, whatever career we choose in the space sciences and in the astronomical sciences, there are a few things that you want to keep in mind that you want to be learning. So you certainly want to keep in mind what the topics are in astronomy and space sciences and, and planetary sciences that are in the know right now, that are, that are being discussed right now, but you also want to keep abreast of the hot topics, the emerging frontier fields that exist, because this could provide a new opportunity for you, especially to come in on the ground floor, to really contribute to this growing field. Um, one area that I've been uh, noticing recently is, that's been growing is the use of machine learning and uh, AI and other types of statistical tools in looking at really difficult, naughty problems in astrophysics and cosmology, for example, you know, with gamma ray bursts, which are the brightest objects in the sky. And so it's interesting to be able to, if I was interested in being a part of that, to be able to know that, that those two fields were uh, coming together, were colliding, that, that machine learning and gamma ray bursts were coming together, that this could be an opportunity for me to use my computer science mind, my data analysis mind, as well as my cosmological uh, preference mind as well. Um, but we also want to ask where is the research taking place that interests us uh, in terms of the location and also the type of institution and if we're going to move into the astronomical sciences whether we're going to be a researcher or in other role we need to know how to read a scientific paper, how to read and write and find grants and get grants, how astronomy and the space sciences are funded, what astronomy teaching consists of, which includes knowing and understanding trends, for example, in virtual online learning and other pedagogical methods. We also need to know what research in astronomy or application of astronomical knowledge looks like, you know, actually how it unfolds, what documents are needed to move forward. You know, uh, Elizabeth, when you have applied for jobs in industry, did you use a CV or did you use a resume or a hybrid? Resume. Uh, nobody ever asked me about my publications. And it wasn't relevant? Nope. So on your resume, you just listed, you had the experiences with the problems you solved and the skills that you gained from the different experiences? Correct, and my education. And your, yeah, of course, yeah, your education, absolutely. See, so that's an important thing. We would not use a resume to apply for a professor posi professorial position. and But I would use a resume to apply for a communications or an outreach role Probably I might even use a hybrid document because I might want to, I would probably want to um, clarify that I have experience in the astronomical sciences and perhaps doing research or writing papers and things of that nature. So there are many different types of documents that you need to know and understand and start building. Um, and that includes, particularly for professorship positions, you will need a research, a teaching, and nowadays even more so a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. Of I'd also add to that list a uh, cover letter, and the cover letter has to be tailored to the role, and the content will be different based whether it's a faculty position or industry position or whatever it is, even the company. I want to be very specific to the company. 100%. Always customize, 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 and remember the job search process is never about what you, the job seeker, can get from me, the decision maker. It's what you, the job seeker, can give, can do 
for me, the jobs, the job decision maker. So in your cover letter, you really want to make alignments and show almost like a mirror image, especially if it's an advertised position between your own experience and what they need and the problems you've solved in the past and how that relates to problems you would solve for them in the future with very specific language taken from the, not only the job ad, but even the organization. And this goes for university positions too. I, I've been on panels, in fact, at the AAS, uh, talking about how to get faculty positions, where um, I remember somebody who was a professor was saying that she works for, in fact, she works for the University of Texas, Austin. They have, is it the McDonald Observatory, I believe, that's there? Right. Yes. Yep. And so yep. she was saying that uh, she has had people apply for faculty positions uh, whose work is relevant to the McDonald Observatory, who do not even mention the existence of the McDonald Observatory in the cover letter. Because, quite frankly, a lot of people write multiple cover letters. They write so many because they're applying for many jobs, and they only write one cover letter, and they really don't customize. But we really have to customize, don't we? Absolutely. Yes, yes, indeed. You really need to, to do your homework and to understand where, where, what it is you're applying for and where, it, where that, that institution is. Uh, you know, mentally, <laughs> as it were, in order to write a good cover letter, yeah. Absolutely. So other things that we want to investigate are where the clusters or hubs are that support space science. So where are the uh, geographic regions where you see a critical mass of companies and institutions and programs and universities, perhaps, that all support space science industry? So for example, in Tucson, we have a big optics cluster which supports astronomical instrumentation. Uh, Seattle, of course, where Elizabeth lives, huge uh, area of aerospace and space sciences, Colorado, Florida, DC, of course, because of the government. But there are other places in the United States and even outside the United States where you will find these clusters. You can Google industry clusters to find out where the industry clusters are for the region, for the, the area that you want, so space science industry clusters. You can also Google what are the industry clusters in Beijing, what are the industry clusters in, uh, in Copenhagen, if you're interested in moving to or living or working in a particular region. Um, we're also trying to investigate how to write a paper, a poster, um, and what fellowships and scholarships we should be thinking about. Uh, e and J, I want to ask you, were there specific fellowships or scholarships that um, either you applied for or, or have gotten, or you would recommend people looking into that are useful if they were to move forward in a career in this area? Yeah, um, I, as a grad student, applied to the Amelia Earhart Fellowship, um, which is for women in aerospace, um, and that includes space sciences. And so um, I received a good chunk of money as a grad student for that, and that afforded me the freedom to attend a couple of conferences that my advisor wouldn't have funded for me otherwise. And um, like doing the work to apply to different fellowships can, can give you a lot of um, freedom because you have your own money to draw from. You don't need somebody else's permission to do it. So um, I recommend making that effort if you have the ability and bandwidth to do so. And uh, what I've noticed is that a lot of universities actually have web pages devoted to fellowship programs. There's also a wonderful website. Um, I believe it's called ProFellow. I think it's called ProFellow.com, which lists out, it's a, it's a completely searchable database of all sorts of fellowships and scholarships. Very, very useful resource for you. Um, and of course, th some of the really prestigious fellowships in astronomy and space sciences are often promoted at AAS. And in fact, they often, at the, uh, conferences and even virtual conferences, uh, often the leaders of those programs are even um, there to promote it and encourage people to apply for those fellowships. So it's it's something to, to think about and put on your list. We keep talking about skills. Um, Elizabeth, what are the top five skills? We have a bunch listed here, but what are the top five skills that you have found are necessary to advance your career in the space sciences and do your job well? Um, in industry or in yeah, general? Well, let's, let's talk about in, in industry since that's been your experience. Okay, um, so communication, um, because um, com I think compared to my experience in academia, I, I talk to my coworkers like much more regularly, like daily, hourly, um, we have regular meetings. Sometimes my days are all meetings. I guess isn't much different from academia, but it's you know centralized to my company. Um, but I also interact a lot directly with clients. Uh, so for example, like tomorrow we'll have a call with Australia in the evening. 
Um, and so being able to be comfortable in communicating slides and doing public speaking, even at a smaller setting, is really critical to my job. Um, writing, um, my background in writing, academic papers go a long way in report writing for my clients. Um, and I get pe pe people from my company send me papers to edit because they know I'll do a really good job of you know, catching all their typos and that kind of thing. And that I have this experience in writing peer reviewed in my peer reviewed publications. And so that gets you to a level of quality that maybe not everybody has experience in writing. Um, project management, which not unfortunately, I don't think there's enough formal training in that in academia. And unfortunately, a lot of people have to learn on the fly. Um, but I believe that that is a really critical one. Um, I, I lead projects on occasion. And so like knowing how to allocate resources and manage people and make sure you're meeting your, your deadlines, that's really important. I think I said three or four skills, um, but I'll punt it over to Joel to <laughs> give a few more examples. Sure. I'm wondering if, by the way, we lost we lost our moderator, <laughs> our, our uh, webinar leader, Elena. I guess she'll be probably back, back on the line. I hope so. But we, we could probably talk about these bullet points um, in some detail for the next five minutes or whatever we have here. Um, I, you know, I think I think all of the essentials are are listed here for you. I, when we talked about this, um, I think uh, last week when we were preparing for for our webinar here, you know, I I kind of stumbled back on writing, which you mentioned. But I guess when I think about it, I I would put um, writing up there with right up there with being able to write good code. So write, writing uh, good prose in in a in a science or oh, I'm not sure what just happened, but okay. Uh, We're back. Oh, <laughs> lost you there, Elena. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Can everybody just, see the slides? On the yes. Slides? Yes, we can now. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, and I, you know, I was okay. I was already saying that we could spend the, at least the next five minutes just talking about these these bullet points you've got right here. But I was I was saying that. That writing um, has has you know prominently figured in my career anyway. If I wasn't a really good writer, I don't think that I, I would have survived because there are so many more brilliant people around all around me all the time um, working in the fields that I'm in. Um, and you know how to understand research papers is essential. That's a, that's what allows you to be a good writer. And then being able to do good, really good, solid data analysis. Um, you know, with just bulletproof analyses of, of the data in front of you is, is really important. Thank you both for that. It's, it's so interesting to me about how we can start thinking about these skills even early on and figure out what it is that we should be doing so that we can start making the roads inwards towards where we want to be. I, I don't think, can you see me by the way, or am I, because I'm not getting a message as to whether or not I'm on camera. Oh, yeah. There you okay. go. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think the uh, the I lost power in my home for a few minutes. That's the oh challenge of living in a monsoon prone city like Tucson, where I live. Um, so we also want to just uh, finalize that it is very important for you moving forward in your career to identify the values and priorities that are important to you. Do what is right for you and your family. That could include issues associated with work-life balance. It might be that you are limiting uh, yourself, and that's totally fine to a certain location in the world as to where you would work. Certainly, you want to uh, spend time with your family, hobbies, community service. Keeping those things in mind now are really going to make a difference in helping you plan your career later. And also recognizing, admittedly, that these also will change as you age. So, I think we'll finalize, we'll finish here, and then I'll just take a few more, we'll take a few more questions and have Elizabeth and Joel um, provide their closing statements. There are some actions you can take right now, particularly as an undergraduate, but honestly, these steps that we're suggesting to you are relevant whether you are, for example, I know someone, one of you is working for as a high school student teacher right now, you could use these, do these things as a high school teacher. If you're working in industry and want to come back to academia, which is totally possible and probable, these are actions you can take as well. Number one, talk to people. Talk to the people who are in the fields, who are, who are in the subjects, who are in the, 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 uh, the ecosystems that you want to work in. Talk to the employment committee. Talk to AAS members. They want to hear from you. And you as a member have currency. You can talk to other members. You can join committees. You can be, interact with committees. It's very, very important. It's very, very useful to do that. Get the information so that you can build not knowledge and also networks right now. Ask for research projects. Be brave like I was. 
for this, these could be formal programs where you find out about like you talk to a professor and you say how can i do you're doing quasars how can i do research in quasars and they tell you that there's a program where you can apply to work as a summer associate and do what's called a research experience for undergraduate reu look into those in quasars perhaps with their colleague in another institution or maybe there's a way to do virtual uh, research right now from, from your home because of COVID. There could be formal programs, there could be informal programs, programs that are created just for you because you asked. Nobody is gonna say, get the heck out of my office because you asked to do research with them, particularly early in your career. As you show them that you are smart, that you are hungry, that you wanna learn, you wanna improve your skills, you wanna understand the universe, people really respond to that. I also encourage you to take advantage of other resources that the AAS has, which means following them on social media, reading their publications, so that you get a prize of the different aspects of the astronomical sciences community. Take astronomy courses, take planetary sciences courses so you can take a taste for it, even if you are not going to pursue a career in it or pursue a major in it, it's useful to take it. Attend colloquia in astronomy, in physics, in astrophysics, in planetary sciences, join the astronomy club and if there's not one start one yourself start researching graduate programs to understand where you would go if you wanted to study x y or z and also start researching the fellowships so we wanted to just give you a couple of tools and one tool is this skill inventory matrix and some of you have seen this um, this is actually something that you will be able to download from the AAS website uh, so it lists out, allows you to download from your brain all the different skills you've gained. A lot of those transferable skills that Joel and Elizabeth were talking about, this is where you can start to think about where those skills come from. They are technology skills and business skills and soft skills and characteristics about you um, that you gain from different experiences, including projects, including interactions from people. Um, you also want to make a needs and a wants list which will also grow and change as you grow and change. What do I need out of my career? What do I want out of my career? So those are a couple of, of good tools to use. Resources for you, the AAS career page, aas.org slash careers, chock full of resources. Um, the AAS also has a summer job webpage that has information about summer job opportunities. Elizabeth Frank, of course, she has a fantastic blog where she writes about careers. So take, check out her website, and she has a number of resources there. The American Institute of Physics, of which the AAS is a partner, has what's called the Statistical Research Center. That center provides data. They do research and provide data about careers in physics and astronomy and the space sciences, so you can get information, hard data about where people are going. Um, I write a column, as you heard, uh, called Your Unicorn Career, which you can access on uh, sciencecareers.org or sciencemag.org and um, of course, uh, Joel Kastner's website uh, on RIT, and then of course, the Employment Committee itself. Okay guys, final advice. Elizabeth, what do you wanna leave the, the audience with today? Yeah, I guess my, just to um, underscore a point that's been a recurring theme here is that nobody gets to tell you what your perfect career is, only you can decide for that yourself. Um, so listen to yourself, figure out what you like and don't like, what's most important to you. Don't let anybody shoehorn you into a box. I had that experience in academia. I did not want to be shoehorned and I was not shoehorned. I couldn't have anticipated that I would ever work for an asteroid mining company, um, even like three months before I had the job offer. So don't be afraid to take risks, take chances, figure out um, what, what opportunities there are for jobs out there. Um, you never know what could happen. Absolutely. Thank you, Elizabeth. Joel, what are your thoughts? Final thoughts? What? I really like Elizabeth's advice, and I guess the only thing I would add is is be an opportunist. Um, you know, just be open-minded. Look for opportunities that that sound interesting, especially as a student, as an undergraduate student, as a graduate student. Um, try to try to be involved in a program, in an academic program that allows you to explore and and uh, has an open mind about what um, the the outcome of the graduates that from that department is going to look like. Um, it's very important to to have that space to be able to explore. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Elizabeth. My final thought to just echo everything that they said, uh, and also just to add that the networking is really going to be absolutely imperative 
to you learning as much as you can about the careers that you want to go into. So having conversations with professors, students, graduate students, going to colloquia and other departments so you can engage in that interdisciplinary discovery, those, are, those actions are going to be absolutely vital to helping you figure out what it is that you want to do with your careers in your lifetime. So as a reminder, you are welcome to continue posting and tweeting uh, at uh, AAS underscore office at E. Frank Planetary at Elena G. Levine. Join me on LinkedIn, uh, of course, so we can send you free career planning resources. We will be giving another webinar uh, in just two weeks exactly. Every other Wednesday is when we give these webinars at every time, the same time. Next time is going to be about marketing your value, so I hope you'll join us for that. And uh, as Diane said, we're also going to be producing a number of tip sheets to help you with your career. Thank you so much for attending. Here's our contact information. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I know you had questions, but you can contact any of us. And I encourage you to contact Joel and Elizabeth in particular because they are members of the Employment Committee of the AAS. They're trying to help you get employed. They're trying to help you move forward in your career. The more insight that you can give them about what your needs are, the more they can better plan programming. So Elizabeth and Joel, thank you so much for the opportunity to work with you today. Thanks, Thanks Elena. It's been fun. And thank you all to the amazing audience and to the AAS for their kind support of this. I wish you all of the best in your career adventures. Thank you so much. Thank you. How do we get out of here, Joel? I don't know. We're stuck. <laughs>